And certainly the private markets continue to get bigger and bigger and, and provide the opportunity for these companies to stay private longer and longer. But, you know, you're seeing these companies still eventually look to the public markets for an exit. It's really for a couple of reasons. One is a lot of compensation is being driven uh, for employees by shares. Having those shares freely tradable on an exchange is really uh, compelling over time rather than having to wait every one, two or three years to do a secondary sale in the private markets. I think the second thing is these companies are, are growing up and getting uh, much larger. They're looking to engage in M&A and having a liquid currency with a price on the screen every minute uh, to do M&A is a lot more powerful than trying to negotiate in private what your company is worth, what the other company is worth. Uh, and I think the final thing is there's really a, a branding element of going public. Uh, it means the company is going to be there for the very long term. Uh, the company's got a pathway to clear profitability that global investors are looking to invest in. So those things are driving everyone, even the companies that said, I'll stay private as long as I can, to be thinking about an IPO and a very buoyant IPO market we're seeing Matt, today. Matt, I know you're going to be in the Martin Sorrell camp on this one, but I'm going to go down the route anyway. This, the, the, the dual listing idea as well, and I know that you, you, I presume, JP Morgan, are looking excitedly at the Lord Hill review on this one as well. But it does mean you get second class investors. And, and I've got to look out for my viewers as well. They become second class uh, investors without the same kind of power over the management team as they would have had historically on single um, listings of shares rather than two dual types of shares, dual class of shares, I should say, rather than dual listing. Uh, that just, just doesn't seem right in terms of for, for my viewers that they should have to basically take on board being second class citizens. And there's a lot of it in technology, isn't there? Yeah, there, there is. And I think a lot of that comes from the, you know, the founder culture of technology companies with a, a strong founder driving the business forward. And I think what gives comfort to the investors stepping into those companies initially in the States, but we're now starting to see that come over here, as, as you mentioned, is that the founder backed companies that have gone public in general and nearly every year have actually outperformed the broader class of IPOs and having a, a single minded founder at the helm uh, has often been a, a boon to the companies. It hasn't worked in every case. Um, but it has worked in many cases, and I think that uh, type of protection has allowed those founders to take a much longer term view to driving their company rather than just managing to meet the most recent update, uh, most recent analyst forecast for the quarter. So, you know, it, it's, it's here to stay. It's not for every company. And there certainly are some investors that you won't be able to access if you go that route. Um, but the U.S. market's proven it works, and it's at least going to be an option for companies uh, in the U.K. and across Europe going forward. To what extent, though, Matt, do you think there's been scarring left by the experience of the Deliveroo IPO? I mean, there are many reasons why perhaps it didn't come out of the gate strong, but maybe some of those could be to do with the listing structure and the, the size of free float. Yeah, listen, well, you know, anytime an IPO happens, there's a postmortem and people try to uh, come up with multiple reasons why, why things happen. I think the important thing for, for any company going public, Deliveroo, among, among many others, is, you know, where does the share go to over time? Do you build the right type of, of strong shareholder base? And I think um, when that IPO happened, they built a strong shareholder base out of the gate. The, the shares didn't perform maybe as, as well as everybody had hoped. But uh, the stock has performed quite well over the course of, of the summer, gotten up uh, closer to the IPO. And I think if you talk to the shareholders that have stepped in at the IPO, they're incredibly bullish about that company over the long term. And so, you know, short term, you get one answer. I think for most of the companies we're taking public, they're taking the longer view. Uh, and they think that even with the, some of the tweaks that they're putting into the governance, the, the core investor base is going to back them. And when the fundamentals come through, the stock is going to perform extremely well. Matt, you're joining us uh, from the sidelines of this uh, JP Morgan European Tech Stars conference this week. So just a broader question. As we look at the industry at the moment, um, who are the stars? Uh, where should our audience be uh, focusing their gaze uh, if they want to make some money here? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, what, what's kind of amazing is every year we think we've, we've kind of peaked as far as uh, tech interest. The next year is about 40, 50 percent more. Uh, you know, we've got over 500 investors really spanning from early stage family offices toward uh, later stage uh, crossover funds. And more exciting, I think, is the breadth and the depth of the different technology companies. If I look back four or five years ago, this conference was made up almost entirely of e-commerce, in many cases, fashion e-commerce companies. And now if you look the the spread of subsectors you're in, in many cases, you <clears throat> even look at, as I say, it's, <clears throat> excuse me, is it, is it even tech? It's, it's, it's more tech enabled. So if you look at digital health, if you look at digital logistics, 
Um, if you look at online food delivery, these are companies that are using tech to really disrupt every sector of the economy. And, and you, you guys were talking earlier about fintech. I mean, fintech companies make up around 25% uh, of the attendees at the conference. But we've got six or seven different core thematic areas that investors are excited in with six or seven uh, unicorns or in some cases decacorns of the conference. And last year, a good portion of the companies that were uh, presenting here have either already gone public or are in the process of going public. And so we're seeing a lot of investor demand of finding that next generation in these core thematic areas I mentioned. Uh, and hopefully we'll see them uh, on the ticker uh, below your screen next year post their IPOs.